This is a guest house in Bhutan, beautifully ornate on the outside and simple and adequate on the inside. This is one of the places I stayed the first time I went to Bhutan, working with the country, as Sally was talking about, on helping to transition in the 21st century. As an, another measure of equi uh, equitable development in the country, all guest houses charge the same price around the country, a re regulated price, $200 a day. That includes your lodging, all your food, all guest services, all transport, and guide services. But a new level of tourism was coming into the country, and a new level of understanding of luxury was coming in the country because of the internet and cable television. When I was there in 2006, Amman hotels were already built in the country. Most of you know about Amman hotels. It's a small luxury chain of hotels. But to bring five-star luxury into the country is really difficult, considering they only have one flight a day into the country and everything else had to come via trucks through the high mountain passes from India. So you can imagine that to stay in this hotel would be substantially expensive. In 2006, it was $2,000 a day per person, minimum. And at this state, to give you a relationship, the average per capita GDP at that stage was less than $600 a year. So just imagine what it feels like for these people to be all of a sudden flooded with this. Some of my colleagues elected to stay in the Amman hotels on my, this trip, but it was not a 100% pleasant experience. One of them had their suitcase opened, and the money, cash, that she had hidden in her suitcase, which was going to go onto a project in Nepal that she was working on afterwards, got taken. Now let's put this, co this act in, in, con in context to the people. You have a Bhutanese who make less than $600 a year, dealing with people who are paying over $2,000 a day, over three times their annual income to rent a room for a day. How does that connect with their brain and their, and, their, and their value system. Would they think it's okay to take this money? I don't know, but it must beg the question, what are we influencing and how are we impacting the people and their happiness? This country is still primarily agricultural, but with the change, when they live in small villages around the country and in high mountain areas, but the call of consumption, of more is more, what we believe seems to be the system throughout the world, that's, and they're bringing them into cities where they have the call to what they now are believing is to be the values. More is more. And parts of Bhutan, like Timpu, this is the capital, is looking more like most other areas in the world, and they're dealing with the same situations we are congestion, where to do with the, with the waste that's being generated. But there's still good things about the exchange. This is a middle school class in Timpu, which we connected with a middle school class in San Francisco. For one, I think of the best things about exchange, exchange of ideas, exchange of understanding, reduction of fear and judgment of people who are different from ourselves. And we must not forget that the increase in GDP is good at this level. It's still very low, but it's dramatically increased. So is happiness sustainable? Based on what we've seen, is this good? And also, is it important? And I have to say to you, and emph emphatically, yes. Happiness is sustainable and is important because I'm gonna tell you how it makes a difference in terms that we in the Western world understand in dollars and cents. Gallup research in 2013 showed that we in the United States alone is losing 
$550 billion a year in lost productivity due to unhappiness. Because unhappiness creates low morale, reduced productivity, absenteeism, lower quality of output, and lower creativity. Workers perform best when they happily engage in doing work that they feel like is meaningful. And health and longevity is directly correlated to happiness. And this is very well substantiated by, by research. But the proudest thing I feel most, most uh, humble to be connected with in Bhutan is the declaration of the International Day of Happiness. Since 2004, Bhutan has been working diligently with the United Nations until in 2012, finally, the United Nations declared International Day of Happiness. Every March 20th of the year is the day when the whole world can celebrate what it means to be happy. And this is what the United Nations said. The General Assembly, conscious that the pursuit of happiness is a fundamental human goal, recognizing also the need for a more inclusive, equitable, and balanced approach to economic growth that can promote sustainable development, poverty eradication, happiness, and the well-being of all peoples. This is why we are here. Sustainability and happiness, eradication, equality. But how do we do this? And how critical is this? I want to give you just one piece of statistic. 1950, over 30% of the world's youth population was in the, from the developed world. 36 years from now, in 2050, only 11% of the world's youth is going to be for the, from the developed world. Why is that important? Because the message we sent from the developed world of what is important, is it sustainability? Is it happiness? Or is happiness just acquiring more stuff, burning more fuel, consuming more stuff? This is where we have an opportunity to choose. And I'd like to close with a Buddhist sutra story, which is completely spread throughout Bhutan and is depicted in both their temples and the storybooks, the story of the four friends. It's the story of the powerful elephant, the intelligent monkey, the agile rabbit, and the bird with flight. And each have unique characteristics, very different from each other, but only when they collaborate and work together, sharing in harmony with themselves, with each other, and the environment. Are they happy? and sustainable. Let's use that as a way for us to move forward. Thank you. <laughs>